before we continue in our service, I kind of want to make a just a quick statement, a quick announcement. Um, uh, just some things that are things that I have been pondering on, and it's going to sound a little awkward, a little weird to you this morning on Easter. And I don't want to rain on your Easter parade. And if you're a guest, please um, uh, bear with me for a moment. But I'm disappointed in Jesus. I've had big dreams when I gave him my life. And, you know, I preach my heart out week in, week out. I've done missions trips. I've baptized people. I've covered his face in kisses. I've, um, I've heard him call me friend. I know that he's nice, and yet I'm tired. I'm exhausted. This Jesus gig hasn't gotten me anywhere at all. And I feel like it's time for me to kind of look out for myself. And I'm cashing in my chips this morning before my world collapses and I hurt more people than I need to. And then I'm headed out before I come to the end of my rope. By the way, let me introduce myself to you. My name is Judas Iscariot. Some of you are breathing a sigh of relief. <laughs> Others of you are like, what the heck is going on? And some of you in this room are roiling in disgust by the fact on Easter Sunday, Judas is standing before you. I know you number me among history's most infamous traitors, people like Benedict Arnold or Brutus, but I'm the most despised. I'm the one that is everyone's villain. I'm the disciple who betrayed Jesus. And I betrayed him with a kiss. It wasn't always that way. When my Jewish mother first saw me when I was born, she looked up and she whispered, Yehuda, God be praised. God, be magnified. Little Judah was a bundle of joy for my mom. My father, Simeon, had big plans for his boy, Judas. But I grew up shrewd, quick with numbers, and even quicker to grasp every situation. I knew how to handle situations. Jesus had other disciples who could handle money, like Matthew, that tax collector, hated him. But Jesus entrusted his money carrying, his money bag to me. He even singled me out as a friend. He called me friend. And when he sent the other disciples to preach, and when he sent the other disciples to do miracles, I went along as well. And after we got back from our mission trip to the Samaritan villages, and we saw people getting healed, and we saw miracles happen, he looked at us and he said, Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And then he said, All of us blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, but they didn't. Sure, I had my failings. But if you're honest, this morning you did as well. Every disciple of Jesus had their failings. St. John, who your pastor has been teaching you guys on, on the Gospel of John, that man badmouths me every chance he gets in his book. But I can tell you right now that John was not a saint. He wasn't perfect. He and his brother James were constantly getting into these ballroom brawls. And I could dish up plenty of dirt if you want to go out for coffee with me on every disciple that's out there. John forgets his own shortcomings, and yet he badmouths me and he calls me a thief, a keeper of the money bag that would help himself to Jesus' money. And the other disciple, that tax collector, Matthew, he would even pile on me when he talks about how I went to the chief priest. He says, what are you willing to give me for me to deliver Jesus to you? He insinuates, he insinuates that I did all this simply so I can just get a few coins. He should talk. Before Jesus had found him, he had betrayed his own country, his own people, and he was stealing from everyone while he was collecting taxes from the Romans. Yeah, I stole from Jesus. So do you. Let's be honest. 
Every time you hold back your tithes and your offerings when the pastor says it's time to give, you don't give. You steal as well. Maybe you haven't sold out Jesus for pieces of silver and pieces of gold, but there are times you sold out Jesus for pleasure and for popularity. We've all stuck our fork in that piece of the pie that belongs only to Jesus. Each of us have cashed in our chips when the going has gotten rough. So be careful not to look down your nose at me because you're just as bad. Don't turn me into this one-dimensional cartoon villain that you can just easily dismiss. You and I have way too much in common for you to put, look, put, put me down. I'm like that car pile up on the freeway. You don't want to look at it when you pass by, but you just can't help yourself. That's me. You, in, you know that there's something of good old Judas lurking in your own soul. So listen to my story, because it could be yours this morning as well. My origins were shrouded in obscurity. It amuses me to watch people try to unravel the mystery by looking at the name Iscariot. Most scholars think that Iscariot is just a nickname. Some say that it means Judas of Karoyat, a region of Judea south of Jerusalem. And this city was the center of the resistance movement, a hotbed of patriotic fever, a recruiting ground for freedom fighters. Most of the Jewish patriots who committed mass suicide at Masada, rather than surrender to the Romans in AD 73, were from my city. And I'm proud to say that's where I grew up. That was my hometown. And I was the only disciple of Jesus that wasn't a Galilean. But Iscariot had other meanings as well. It could mean Judas of Iscari. That's Latin for dagger men. And our knives dispatched many a Roman occupier. The Sakari were a secret society of assassins, like car bombers in the Middle East. We would slip into marketplaces with knives flashing, striking fear into the hearts of collaborators. Others would see the similarity to Iscariot, to a Hebrew word that means liar, Judas the liar. Still others will look at the Aramaic word that means to deliver up. Judas, the one who delivered up Jesus. And others would argue that it sounds to a, very similar to another Aramaic word that means constrict or choke. Judas, the one who strangled himself with the news. Talk about sick gallo humor, right? Instead of such mean spiritedness, remember me for what I was. I was a young Israeli freedom fighter who dreamed of a messianic kingdom promised by our Old Testament prophets. When I first saw Jesus, I thought I had found him. I thought I found the Messiah. One false Messiah after another had dashed our old hopes over and over again. But this one was the real deal. This one was it. This one was legit. It wasn't easy being the only Judean in a company of hillbilly Galileans. I like Simon the Zealot. He was a patriot just like me. But Matthew the tax collector made my skin crawl. The rest of the Galilean associates were country hicks. I couldn't understand how Jesus would forge a kingdom out of such misfits. And why he would attract people who were prostitutes, cripples, lepers, losers in my mind. When I saw the miracles that Jesus performed... When I listened spellbound to his mesmerizing teachings, when I watched the crowds that he attracted, I knew that this man had the right stuff, that he had the M.O. to overtake Rome. And I especially loved how he talked about the kingdom. That was his constant conversation. I really got into that prayer, thy kingdom come. I wanted to cheer that day when he lambasted um, those religious fat cats who collaborated with the Romans while they fleeced their own people. I got a rush when he gave me the power to heal the sick and to cast out demons and prophesy. This was amazing. This was going to be an incredible kingdom, and I probably didn't even need to have my sword, and I was going to be a big shot. And so I joined Jesus' little crowd right from the beginning. Listen, I can tell you right now that I totally missed why Christ came. I had no idea. I wanted a prophet who would advance my political ideology, a Messiah who would remake my world, not a personal savior. As long as I had my dagger and my schemer's ability to outwit my enemies, I could take care of myself. 
I wanted him to sit on a conqueror's throne and me to be right next to him. I didn't want him to hang on a Roman cross. I needed Jesus to fulfill my dreams and was willing to give him everything as long as he did it my way. And when it comes to following Jesus, maybe there's a little old Judas in you as well. Remember, I was quick with numbers. It's, I had the schemer's ability to size up situations really quick. Those thick-headed Galileans, Peter, James, Andrew, John, those guys never figured it out. Right up to the Lord's Supper, they were still arguing about who was going to get the seat next to Jesus in the kingdom. And even before he ascended to heaven, those numbskulls were still asking Jesus, are you going to restore the kingdom now? Listen, you may alleviate Peter, James, and John as saints. But let's be honest, they were in it just as much for themselves as I was. The irony was I figured out the true meaning of what Jesus was saying before they did. He came to die as a sacrifice for the sins of his children, and he made it clear in his teachings. Remember him saying, for the Son of Man, speaking of himself, did not come to seek and save. He came to seek and save that who who was lost. Jesus was always hell-bent toward the cross. There goes any dreams of a liberated Palestine. And that's when Jesus broke my heart. Maybe he's broken your heart as well. Maybe you prayed for him to change things in your life, but he didn't. Maybe you prayed for healing and the cancer came back. Your loved one died. Mr. Wright never came along. The interview didn't go as well. You served him with everything you had, but he didn't give you what you hoped for. What's a follower of Jesus to do when he doesn't lead you to your dreams? When you pursue him and you think that as you pursue him, he's going to give you what you want, and he doesn't. I did what every embittered person would do so often. I began to cash in my chips. I figured that as long as Jesus was going, wasn't going to deliver on my dreams, I might as well get everything I can out of my service for him. So I began to steal from the money bag. I was like the unloved spouse who began to cheat, the disappointed child who manipulates his parents, the pastor who per- abuses his parishioners, the politician who takes bribes on the side, the disillusioned church members who just constantly sow dissent. And before we traveled to Jerusalem for that last time, he said to us, as you know, Passover is in two days away, and the Son of Man is going to be handed over to be crucified. And all of our dreams were shattered then. The next night, we were eating at his friend Lazarus' house in Bethany outside Jerusalem, and I was in a sour mood when Lazarus' sister Mary began to break a bottle of perfume and pour it on Jesus' feet. By now, I knew the cause was lost, and I was wishing that she would have just given us the perfume. I could have sold sold it and got some money for myself. I rebuked Jesus. I said, Jesus, you could have turned that perfume into cash, and we could have fed the poor with it. The truth was, I didn't care about the poor. I just wanted some money for myself. And as quick as a flash, Jesus rebukes me publicly in front of everyone. He says, leave her alone. She's preparing me for my burial. Hopes dashed. Dreams crashed. But the next day, there was hope again. Because the next day as we came to Jerusalem, there was revolution that was in the air. There was excitement that was going on. More than two million pilgrims had gathered in Jerusalem for the Passover. The Roman garrison were on, sitting on edge, nervous about what was going to happen. All it would take was just a few people to rile up the crowd, and Rome would be done with forever. The Sicarii had already infiltrated the city. They were sharpening their daggers. Freedom fighters, like my friend Barabbas, were taking positions throughout the city. And Jesus looked at us and he ordered us to go and get him a donkey's colt. And my ears began to prick up. 
Ancient kings of Jerusalem entered the city on a donkey's colt. And as Jesus approached the city on a colt, I realized that we were headed straight toward the eastern gate, the one that the ancient kings rode through on their inauguration day. This was the very reason I left everything to follow him. This was the very reason the others had left everything to follow him. And we quickly began to go and cut down palm trees and palm branches and began to hand them out to the crowd. And they began to wave just as they did when the ancient kings would enter through the eastern gate. And the crowd got caught up in the excitement and they began to sing the ancient greetings that they did to the ancient kings. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. We threw our coats on the dust in front of him. And after he passed through the gates, he bounded up the stairs of the temple. He braided strands of rope with a whip and he exploded in anger. It was exhilarating. Religious hucksters were running away in terror. This was our king. This was what I was dreaming for. This was what I was hoping for. And in the next couple of days, he walked down the streets of Jerusalem, cursing down the establishment. My hope was renewed. It was refreshed. But then Jesus pulls back again. And he begins to talk about another kind of a kingdom. A future kingdom, a heavenly kingdom. Talking about things like dying for sins. Talking about the way of the cross. And my whole world began crashing down when he said these words. He said, truly, I tell you that unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Jesus is still hell-bent on going to the cross. He still was wanting to die Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. It was really over now. I was done. His bones would soon be buried with all the other false messiahs that promised they would deliver us from Rome. And I saw the handwriting on the wall while those Galileans were still counting chickens that would never hatch. So I figured I'd make the most out of a bad situation by turning in my chips for at least some return for these last three years. I was going to take him for every penny. Jesus had prophesied, I remember him saying this, that one of us was going to betray him. I figured if one of us was going to betray him, might as well be me. We can always justify things by putting a God spin on it, can't we? And so I went to the chief priests, and I began to cut a deal with them. Those cheapskates were only willing to give me 30 pieces of silver to turn Jesus over. A slave's price for a king. And what an irony. It was a fraction of the worth of the perfume that Mary had broke to anoint Jesus' feet. But it was the best deal I was going to get. Revenge never pays off the way that you and I think. Two evenings later, we were up in the upper room. It was just Jesus and us disciples. Galileans, those morons, were still dreaming of a triumphant kingdom. But I knew better. The longer I sat there, the angrier I got. And then Jesus scolded us because we, all we were talking about was position and power. And he said that we should have a servant's heart. And he got up and he took off his clothes and he wrapped a towel around his waist and he bent down and he began to wash our feet. I never felt more dirtier in that moment than the moment that Jesus was washing my feet. And I sat there silently through this Passover meal. And then Jesus said something that made the very hairs of my neck stick out. He said, very truly I say to you, one of you is going to betray me. My secret was out. And the rest of these Galileans looked at each other and they they were asking, is it me? Is it me? And it wasn't them. It was me. I knew it was me. And I relaxed for a moment, but then he turned and he looked deep into my soul and he dipped a piece of bread into the salt and he said, is the one to whom I give this piece of bread that's going to betray me? And I thought my head was going to explode when he handed it to me. Jesus knew. He knew. He always does. 
and anger began to well up inside of me. A rage I couldn't control. And Matthew, later in his gospel, would say that the devil took possession of me. And I got up and I left. I knew what I had to do. I found my way to the chief priest's house and I sealed the bargain with the devil. I was glad that if Jesus insisted on dying, at least I was going to get something out of it. I would have to take them to Jesus in the night and identify him with the kiss, but I was going to leave a little bit more richer. And so I led them. And we found Jesus a little after midnight in a garden called Gethsemane. And the soldiers pushed me through toward the disciples. And I felt angry. I felt ashamed. Here I am, a freedom fighter, wanting to get Israel delivered from Rome. And now I'm collaborating with the enemy for 30 lousy pieces of silver. I betrayed my country. I betrayed my people. I betrayed my master. I betrayed my friends. I wanted to cut and run, but it was too late. Jesus knew why I was there. He gave me a look of hurt mingled with compassion, and he said, friend, do what you came to do. He knew what I was going to do, and he still called me friend. I was embarrassed with shame. I was about to put Jesus on a cross, and he calls me his friend. But the die was cast. I built up my courage, and I stepped forward, and I kissed him on the cheek, and Jesus jumps back as if I had slapped him, and he says, do you betray me with a kiss? And I felt so small. I'll never forget how he looked at me in that moment. I'll never forget the anger on the disciples' faces as they looked at me, as they stared at me in contempt. The temple guards shoved me out of the way in disdain. I was no longer any use to them. I wandered the streets in a stupor filled with remorse for what I have done. Those of you who have ever betrayed someone else, you know how I feel. Everything I had ever stood for had gone up in smoke, revenge that had tasted so sweet earlier that evening had now turned sour in the dark night. The morning news broke and I heard that the Sanhedrin had condemned Jesus to death and they were turning him over to the Roman, to the Roman governor. And I stumbled into the chambers of the high priest, hoping to stop this tra travesty, hoping that they would change their minds. I threw the 30 pieces of silver at them, and I said, I've sinned, and I betrayed innocent blood, but they just laughed at me, and they said, what is it, about, what is it to us? That's your problem. That's your responsibility. It was my responsibility. I had sinned, and I had to atone for it. I didn't know that the very one I had betrayed was going to be nailed to the cross as an atonement for sins even worse than mine. I could have trusted in his death to make right what I had done wrong, but instead I decided to take matters into my own hands. I went out and I got a rope, and Jesus' words kept echo echoing in my head, you betray me with a kiss. You betray me with a kiss. The streets were empty. Everyone had gone to see the crucifixion of the man I had betrayed. And I stumbled around the gates of the city to the city garbage dump. At the edge of the cliff, I, overlooking the valley called Gehenna, I found a tree. And down below, lepers and homeless beggars were sifting through mountains of garbage looking for food. Smoke bellowed out of the debris, acid in my nostrils. I remember Jesus one day teaching us that hell was going to be what, just like a henna was. And that's what I felt like I had deserved. And so I fashioned a noose, put it around my neck, slung the other end over a branch and jumped out into the abyss. And after a failed life, I couldn't even commit suicide successfully. The branch snapped. I landed belly down on the jagged rocks below. Life has its ironies. And at the same time, on another garbage dump outside the city, Jesus also hung from a tree. We both went into our own hell. We both were split open. 
Both of us died an agonizing, bloody, lonely death, despised, rejected. But our deaths were as different as night and day. I was guilty. He was innocent. I didn't have to die to atone for my sins. He had to die to atone for sinners like me. When he died, hell was finished for all of those who put their trust in him. When I died, hell was just beginning for me. I accomplished nothing by my death. He accomplished everything by his. I lived for a kingdom that would always die. He died for a kingdom that would live on for eternity. He rose from the dead on the third day. My bones still lie buried in an unmarked grave in the potter's field. And now I've come across this great divide, like the old, like the ghost old Jacob Mar Marley and Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol coming to warn Ebenezer Scrooge. And I've come to warn you that God loves you so much that he doesn't want your life to end up like mine. That's why he sent his only begotten son to die on a cross for your sins, for my sins. And that's why he sent me to you today. Listen, no matter where your life is, no matter what you've done, it's never too late for things to change. No pit that you have dug or someone else has dug for you is so deep that God's love isn't deeper still. If Easter Sunday teaches us anything at all, it's this, it's not over till it's over, and then it's still not over. I thought it was over when Jesus said that he was going to die on a cross. My hopes were dashed because I thought he was going to be another failed Messiah. And so I made a devil's bargain. And maybe you've done the same. You try to cash in your chips, and the payoff ended to be your own version of 30 pieces of silver. You ransomed the king for slaves' wages, and your life is now a mess. There is no joy. It's full of despair. But can I encourage you, don't do what I did. There are a lot of ways to make a noose and strangle your life in some act of despair. I knew that he was going to die but I didn't remember the teachings of Jesus that said that he was going to rise from the grave after three days. If only I had waited. If only I didn't try to take action on my own. On Black Friday, all I could see was the mess that I had made of things around me. But Sunday was on the way. What a difference a couple of days makes. My sin was no worse than Peter's denial or Thomas's doubting or the other disciples running away in fear when Jesus needed them the most. They all betrayed him in one way or another. Every one of them cashed in on their chips. And each of you have betrayed him. You betrayed our, yourselves. For sure, you've betrayed Jesus more times than you care to admit. If only I had waited. If only I had waited. I could have received the same forgiveness that Peter did, the rest of the disciples did, that the Apostle Thomas did. I was so caught up in my disappointment over failed dreams and lost causes that I didn't hear Jesus say that he was coming back from the dead. He said, I'm the resurrection. I'm the life. He repeatedly said he's coming back. His bones wouldn't lie in a graveyard of other failed messiahs. If only I had listened, will you? Will you? Will you listen? I can hear his voice even now. Do you hear him? Do you listen? Would you listen to him? I've got to go away back to another place. But he has risen. And he's in the world today. 
by the Spirit of the living God, he walks the aisles of this church down the rows and is standing in front of you this morning. You can't see him except through the eyes of faith, but I assure you he's here today. He's atoned for your sins. You can't pay for them any more than I could pay for the price of my own sins. All you can do is receive the free gift of eternal life. Ask him to save you. Ask him to change you. Filled with resurrection power, you will experience a resurrection life that will change you and your world.